I go down research rabbit holes a lot. Recently I was watching a lot of videos about Afghanistan and in one of these videos something caught my eye. There was this panning shot of a landscape and in the sky were a bunch of kites. Maybe you're thinking, yeah, that's a little strange, but whatever, it's just kids having fun. At the time, I thought basically the same thing. I just continued watching the video and thought nothing more of it. Until about a week later, when I was driving in the car, listening to a book about Afghanistan, and they were outlining how after the Soviet Union fell, the Taliban began taking over, and in 1996, they started outlawing a lot of things. Fear and uncertainty were mixed with joy today as the retreat of Soviet military power from Afghanistan is complete. The Soviet trained and equipped Afghan army is falling apart. Troops looted and then abandoned former Soviet outposts. So people were happy when the Taliban came. For a while, yes, because the Taliban could bring peace here. But as you see, they have uh, imposed some laws on people that uh, I can't put the people in trouble. They started outlawing a lot of things. Things like dancing, television, kite flying, cinema. Wait, what? Kite flying? As soon as I heard that, my mind went right back to that panning shot of the kite-filled sky over Afghanistan. But why? Why would the Taliban care about kite flying? That was the small detail that sparked my curiosity on this topic. And after a fair amount of research, I can honestly say I get why the Taliban outlawed kite flying. I don't agree with it, but their reason for doing so is a lot more logical than you might think. Let's start with a brief history of the kite. Kites were invented in Asia, though their exact origin can only be speculated. The oldest depiction of a kite is from a Mesolithic period cave painting in Luna Island in Indonesia, which has been dated from about 9500 to 9000 years BC. By the time the kite made it to what is now modern day India and Pakistan, it was evolving into a fighter kite. Now this is a bit of a side note, but we're in this rabbit hole together, so buckle up. Over the last 2000 years, Kites have been adapted to fit all kinds of purposes. A few examples, there's this book called the Samguk Segi, which is a historical record of three kingdoms of Korea. It was completed in the year 1145 and is well known in Korea as being the oldest surviving chronicle of Korean history. Wow. This book describes an event that took place in the year 647 when a Korean general used flaming kites to rally his troops and by doing so also scared the enemy. Russian chronicles talk about a prince, Oleg of Novograd, who used kites during the siege of Constantinople in 906. According to these records, he crafted horses and men of paper and then lifted them into the air over the city. The Greeks saw them and feared them. And finally, more recently, the British army actually experimented with using kites to haul human lookouts into the air around the time of World War I. And although they managed to do it, as far as I know, these kites were never used during any wartime operations. But now let's get back to Afghanistan. Afghan kite flying, also known as kite fighting, is essentially a national sport. And this isn't just a sport that the kids play. Even elders and government officials are known to participate. In these fights, the kites are flown at high altitudes and the goal is to break the opposing kite's string. Well, show me if you would the string because it's extraordinary. It's covered in glass. If the cut kite is not captured, then it is assumed that the kite belongs to no one and the kite runners, typically younger children, will attempt to pursue and claim it. Now here's why the Taliban outlawed kite fighting. Traditionally, the big day for kite flying is Friday. Friday also happens to be the Muslim day of prayer. Much like in the West, we think of Sunday as being a day for church. Or maybe tellingly, some think of it as football Sunday. Good afternoon everyone and welcome. Today our main event on Sports Sunday features a battle of champions. If you grew up in church like I did, perhaps you've seen congregants scramble out of their pews as quickly as they possibly can to catch the big game. Or maybe they leave church early. Maybe they don't even show up. You know? Heathens. Well, that's the effect that kite flying had in Afghanistan. And that's the reason cited by the Taliban for getting rid of it. According to the Taliban, kite flying was un-Islamic and it distracted people from Allah. To a lesser extent, they also mentioned the injuries and even death that kite fighting had caused, especially when people used illegal materials to reinforce their kite strings to make them more deadly. Materials like metal, which was sharp to the touch, was especially hazardous for the kite flyer and then for those who would run to catch the falling kite. Okay, so that's the reason. But in my research, there's one other thing that I found to be kind of interesting. In an Afghan magazine that I came across, I read an article in which the author made the case that kite fighting has some eerie parallels to the violent conflicts that the region has found itself in the middle of. To make this case, the author examines the three main roles of Afghan kite fighting. One, 
the kite flyer, who physically directs the kite by holding the string. His hands are at risk of being cut, but he's the one on the ground who is responsible for attacking the opponent's kite. He compared this role to the Afghan people who have found themselves carrying weapons and fighting sometimes on behalf of other countries or powerful forces in the region. 2. The String Giver The String Giver usually holds the glass-covered string reel and dispenses it to the kite flyer from a short distance. He encourages the kite flyer and pushes him to fight aggressively. The author compared this to the foreign powers who provide resources and direct the locals to fight, and then watch the violent events occur from a safe distance. Their hands aren't likely to bleed. And finally, number three, the kite runners. These are the crowds of young men and boys who, when one of the kites involved in a fight has been downed, will race to retrieve it. These are usually people that couldn't otherwise afford a kite, or maybe they just like the bragging rights of claiming one that has fallen. This would be analogous to the warlords and groups that rush in after one power finally retreats and leaves their cities, resources, or weapons free for the taking. I don't know if there's anything to that theory, but if sports can be a form of self-expression, perhaps the article is onto something. And that's about where my research into kite flying in Afghanistan ended, at least for now. <laughs>